You've almost certainly seen this type of graph before, which represents the oscillations of a sound wave over time. But for those just starting to understand acoustics, this representation can be a bit confusing. That's because sound waves are longitudinal, while the waveform on this graph appears to be transverse. What does this mean? I'm glad you asked. In basic terms, a transverse wave causes the medium to move perpendicular to the direction of the wave. This type of wave can be observed with a string. When one end of the string is moved up and down, it creates a disturbance in the string that will ripple to the other end. In this case, the wave of energy causes the string to move perpendicular to the direction of the wave, and it looks very similar to the sound wave representation I mentioned earlier. However, a sound wave in a room is not transverse, but longitudinal, meaning that the medium moves parallel to the direction of the wave. You can see a visual representation of that in this dot animation. The driver first compresses the air particles together by moving forward, and then the particles are rarefied when the driver returns to its resting position. The energy from this small movement on one end of the tube creates ripples from particle to particle all the way to the other end. Now, don't get me wrong, the first graph is very useful when studying and discussing sound waves. However, I find the second animation to be much more intuitive when learning to visualize sound and how it travels through a room. There's a very important detail I'd like you to notice in both of these cases. That is, that the particles in the medium itself only move back and forth. It's the energy that travels along the length of the medium. Look at the string example. The end of the string simply moves up and then down again. It's the energy that's traveling from end to end, not any one part of the string itself. The same principle holds true for the longitudinal air particle animation, which is made more clear in this animation where you can see the back and forth oscillations of these individual red dots. The energy travels from particle to particle as the wave propagates through the air, but the individual air particles travel only a short distance. Let's take these theoretical principles and apply them to the real world. We can create both a transverse wave and a longitudinal wave using a simple slinky spring. By moving one end perpendicular to the length of the spring, we see a transverse wave arise. I can increase the amplitude of this wave by increasing the amount of displacement on the driver end. Now, rather than creating a transverse wave, I'll create a longitudinal wave of energy by moving the spring parallel to its length. We can see that the spring is bunched together in compression when I push forward, and then it's stretched apart in rarefaction when I pull back. And if we fix one end of the spring, we can see reflections returning in the other direction in both the transverse and the longitudinal examples. These examples have all been two-dimensional so far, but as you know, sound in a room is three-dimensional. The same principles apply, but things get much more complicated because there are so many more variables at play. For one, the energy ripples outward in all directions when we create sound in a physical space. For a perfect point source, this would look like a sphere of compressions and rarefactions, which is more challenging to capture in a two-dimensional animation. Another variable that complicates things even further is the fact that the room itself has boundaries such as the floor, walls, and ceiling. This is similar to the fixed end of the spring reflecting energy backward. However, in just a short amount of time, the energy in a room may reflect off of several surfaces, and the unique construction materials, angles, and dimensions of the room will result in much more complicated interference, both constructive and destructive. Plus, it's important to remember that we're only observing a single frequency in each of these examples. In reality, sounds are composed of many different frequencies, each with a unique wavelength that adds an additional layer of complexity. This actually leads me to one of my favorite questions in audio. Why does the same note played on two different instruments sound so different? If you've ever asked this question yourself, click the video that's on your screen now to learn the answer. I'll see you there.